welcome to everybody that's joined in with us again, um, kind of for another edition of our Consiglio Wellness Center and uh, our wellness team that we've got composed here, uh, talking a little bit about what we've kind of coined the phrase of commit to be fit. And that is our theme moving forward, at least through the summer and the fall. And we've got quite a group here today. Uh, so we'll introduce everybody here as we move forward. But uh, really excited that everybody could join us. We do have some updates on some things that are happening inside the Wellness Center. And uh, we also have a very special guest with us today that will drive most of our, our commentary. But as normal, we have uh, Casey Hazy, who is with us, who has been in charge of our programming and putting together our classes that are on a slight delay for the time being. And then, of course, the director of the Wellness Center, we've got Sherry Bennett with us. But we also have... Hello. Hello, Sherry. <laughs> and uh, so, Casey, anything from your end that's been going on that you want to bring us up to speed before we introduce our special guest? You know, from a fitness standpoint, we're still virtual. Um, we're preparing for the gym to be open, but nothing really has changed per se for us. Okay. Um, Sherry, new things happening at the Wellness Center real quick. Um, not not much new. We uh, continue to offer telehealth visits for, um, you know, some of the things that you would have normally come into the clinic um, to be seen. We're doing some of those over the telemedicine. Um, you can just call the clinic and get set up for an appointment there. Um, we still offer some in-person visits if, if the situation warrants, but give us a call and we can get that set up. Fantastic. And that kind of leads us in real quick. And so we appreciate everybody joining in and we want to be very mindful of people's time. So um, we're going to introduce real quick our uh, special guest, which is Dr. Sydney Spears. And uh, Dr. Spears or Sydney, as she would prefer to be called, I believe, uh, is just uh, to kind of put things in a very quick nutshell, I guess, is a clinical um, social worker, a psychotherapist. She is a professor at KU. Uh, kind of focuses on mindfulness as a teacher and a professor there. So, uh, Sydney, it's it's so great to have you with us. And uh, at this special time that we're dealing with, uh, I couldn't think of a more appropriate person to have on our on our show tonight. So, thank you. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to join all of you. And so, Sydney, I guess uh, we can get into you know get into it pretty quick here. But my first question to you would be. What does a mindfulness coach actually do? And, and what, as, as far as what you do, how does that really relate to the moment that we're dealing with right now? Yeah, that's a really good question. What I tend to do with um, my clients, uh, be they clients who are in therapy, and if it's appropriate, and if they're open to it, as well as other people whom I work with in the community, um, because I do some work with veterans, too, at the Kansas City VA for some vets who have experienced post-traumatic stress. So especially in those two contexts, in terms of mindfulness, I try to help them understand that mindfulness at the end of the day is really, really, really participating in something that's difficult because it's a self-study. At the end of the day, that's what it is. It's like, can we turn our awareness and our attention, especially in the present moment, rather than being caught off into the past, which we don't really have that. The past has impacted us. That's no doubt about it. But we don't really have that in this moment. Or being caught off into the future, kind of overworrying or ruminating about, you know, what's going to happen. Uh, we don't have either one of those ends of the continuum but we do have now. So helping people develop the skill base so that they are able to turn more inward and get more information and more data about, hmm, so what am I really experiencing in terms of how am I really thinking? Uh, what are my thoughts? What am I really feeling in the present moment? Um, what am I sensing in my body? And when I say sensing, I'm talking about the connection to sensations, be the sensations tingling or pain, or um, it could be temperature, for example, it could be cold, hot. But those are all channels of information, really rich information that we have located in our bodies that 
sometimes we're disconnected. So, so um, mindfulness as a practice can afford us the benefits and the opportunities to really know more about our own experience, like I said, in the present moment. And then without harsh judgment, we've got to lift the judgment off of that to really see it in this kind of neutral way, rather than getting caught up with some more negativity, for example. And just being more inquisitive and more curious, like, hmm, I noticed that every time I talk to this person, or I listen to the news on the COVID virus, that I started to get, have these thoughts that are very, very stressful and difficult. What are those thoughts, really? And I'm, I'm, it, I'm feeling something here, but do you really know what you're feeling? Can you even identify the feelings? Or do you just kind of walk off and just kind of take an automatic response of, oh, I can't do that anymore. I'm just going to walk off. So just the automatic response is, pretty much habituated in our brains and in our nervous systems. And unless we bring some intentional focus to what we're really experiencing and kind of unpacking that and being more curious about, hmm, wonder why that happened, wonder why I did just want to walk away. We, we can't change anything. We really cannot change anything thoroughly until we are conscious of what we're really experiencing in the present moment. So that, that's, in a nutshell, that's what I help my clients and the people at the VA and the other people that I work with, even my students oftentimes, um, get more cognizant about and understand. It's certainly not easy, but it has a plethora of benefits, like decrease of stress, speaking of the COVID situation. Um, decrease of anxiety, and this is according to evidence-based research, as well as decrease of depressive symptoms. And if you think about it, the more I can become aware of what I'm thinking, the more I'm able to say, okay, I have some clarity here. So therefore, it may give me information about, well, how do I need to relate or navigate those stressors rather than just automatic and quick response of, habituated patterns that I've been caught up in. And it's like, it's only one way to navigate the COVID virus. It's only one way, my habituated one, because I haven't developed the mindfulness skills to unpack what I'm really experiencing and how I truly relate to my stressors. Let me, I, let me ask you this real quick. Um, Sydney, as I, as I um, health and, and life coach myself, I find that people's abilities to tap into living in a mindful strategy is a bit all over the place. Like there are some people that are, have that ability that they, they tend to live in the moment and they actually have a mindful spirit maybe, whereas there's a lot of other people that uh, really struggle with that. Have you noticed that? And, and if so, what is that magic formula to keep people uh, in the moment and, and being aware of those situations, as you just mentioned, the, you know, the, the feelings, the emotions, et cetera? How, how, do, how do we draw those individuals more towards that, that, that point where they are someone that can live in that moment to where they actually experience the benefits of being a mindful person, let's say? Yes, uh, and you're absolutely right in terms of for some people being more mindful is not as difficult, but actually for most of us, because we also live in the United States and this grand mainstream culture is very embedded in not being so mindful because we're in a society that's all about values wise of production and striving and pushing ahead and quick, you got to get it done quickly. <laughs> Um, you can't sit around too long. You've got to keep moving. You can't rest on your laurels. So that certainly has an impact on all of us, too, because we absorb some of those values and ways of being. Um, but in terms of how to help people like that, which is most of us in the United States, it's through practice. Um, there's one thing to understand the conceptual pieces of mindfulness, which I just explained. 
But it's another thing to actually put that in practice. And it is very challenging. There is no doubt about it. But if one is willing, then there are various practices of mindfulness, such as meditation. That's one practice. Uh, such as mindful movement. That's another practice. And actually, there's a whole umbrella of what we call contemplative practices that mindfulness and meditation and mindful movement are under. Um, people journal. Sometimes I'll ask people, well, do you, have you ever journaled before, even if you just did it for a little while? Have you ever done that? And if they have, and if they have said, yes, I have, then there's, there's a way to connect the dots because actually that's another contemplative kind of mindfulness-based practice for many people because you have to stop and reflect. What am I really thinking? What am I feeling? I'm going to write it down here. Um, and then, for instance, practicing yoga, uh, tai chi, qigong, um, Feldenkrais method. There's lots of other mindful movement um, methods that people have been practicing all along. And some of them are totally clueless that that is really practicing kind of a moving meditation. Um, Taking, taking a walk in nature, for example. I'll ask people, hey, do you walk, do you run, those kinds of things. Have you ever walked and, and if you did run, and, and have you had an experience out in nature where you really did kind of stop and savor and really look at, even if you took a break when you were running, you kind of looked around the path and like, wow, you know, these trees or how beautiful the sky is. Well, that's all calling one's attention to the present moment. So I try to connect the dots from things that people may have already experienced in little moments of mindfulness and to help them understand that, you know, you could, if you wanted to keep developing these skills and practicing in ways that are best for you or most useful, you could deepen your mindfulness because you've already done it in this small way. Um, it could be, oh my God, I, I was with my kids and they were out uh, at their soccer game and I was just laser focused <laughs> on my kid <laughs> to see if they were gonna score with their team, for example. And um, it was like, everything else stopped because I'm right here with my child. That is being mindful. There wasn't any judgment. It was like, no, and even savoring it because mindfulness is not just about noticing difficulty. It's also about noticing things that bring us pleasure too. And can we really savor that and be with it in that moment? So that, and then the other thing is to help people. This is probably the hardest one, and it's a big piece of developing the skill. Slowing down. <laughs> um, and even if one was running, let's say, you could be physically running, but can you slow down and notice your own internal experience of running? as well as external. Can you notice? Can you notice your breath, for example? And can you really notice your breath? And not just thinking of it cognitively, but really feeling your breath or feeling your shoulders, feeling the muscles as you're moving, feeling your quadriceps as they're moving. So um, that's the other part that I uh, invite people to partake in. And then they sometimes will say, oh my God, okay, I've done that in little forms again, where I did slow down, or I needed to slow down because I'm, my life is so out of balance. So that's, those are some of the ways that I've helped people connect the dots. My experience too has been, I would say that one of the, the best steps to get started, and maybe you can expand on this, is if somebody hasn't really ever experimented or tried to work into a more mindful state, that controlling breathing might be the initial step to get people started in that journey. Um, how, would, how would you relate that and how would you expand from there if that would be the case? Uh, you mean in terms of just helping people be more aware of their breath? Exactly. Like you said, like some people could walk through the woods, as you mentioned a moment ago, and never experience any of what you just said. And then other people live in that moment most of the time. For those people that struggle with mindful thoughts, how would you approach that? Well, you know, when you brought up the breath, that was just perfect in many ways because a lot of learning about mindfulness is based out of the body. 
um, being aware of the various sensations, as I mentioned before, as well as breath, because breath is a sensation. But the great thing about breath for those people who are open to noticing breath, because I do want to say there are some people, and I'm very sensitive to this, there are some people where noticing their breath can actually be more anxiety provoking. Mm -hmm. So I'm always kind of following the lead of the other person uh, because I don't want to cause any harm to them. Or they might have a cold or they might have asthma. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why some people may not want to notice breath. And that's putting that trauma sensitive uh, lens on um, potential invitations. But um, one of the things about breath is that we have to remember we're talking about connecting to our nervous systems. And when it comes to mindfulness, mindfulness is so nervous system based because it's all about, again, being aware of our bodies and really connecting and befriending our bodies instead of beating our bodies up, listening to those signals from the breath. Let's say somebody gets really stressed because they've been, again, listening to too much news or on social media or on CNN, whatever, about the COVID situation. And they, they may notice like, oh my God, again, that example I gave before, I need to walk away. But if you were more mindful, you would stop and notice your breath. Where is your breath in your body? Where might it even be located? What is the expression of your breath? Is it short, which usually under stress, people's breath gets shorter. Uh, as opposed to deep and long and more diaphragmatic. So where is your breath in your body? And if you are noticing the sensations, you're getting that lovely body wisdom, which is mindful. And especially if you can do it without criticizing yourself or beating yourself up, but just noticing and using that as a potential way of telling you, hey, I'm giving you information. This, this might show you what you might need you might have some choices other than that one dimensional choice you've been making of just getting up and walking away, that automatic response. And it can teach your nervous system actually a new way of being. So that's one of the benefits of mindfulness because there's all the neuroscience connected to it to show that yes, we're talking about changing the brain as well, our nervous systems with mindfulness, not just, oh, I just noticed a thought. Uh, it's much deeper than that. So not just breath, but noticing sometimes when people are walking, we invite people to notice the soles of their feet when they're walking, because that can give some people, especially if they're really hyped up and uh, they're really super, super stressed um, or even depressed for that matter, because they're really down. If they notice the sensation of what does it feel like to actually sit each foot down, one in front of the other, when I'm walking? What does it feel like? Do I feel a sense of support in my own body? Um, do I feel a sense of groundedness and connection to the earth? Um, you know, what is it that I'm feeling? So it can even calm some people down because we're connecting, again, sensory motor-wise to the nervous system. So again, that's one of the, the beauties of those types of som somatic practices or when I say somatic, I'm talking about body awareness practices. That's, that's absolutely incredible advice. Um, I think I'll turn it over to the girls and, and any questions that they might have in regards to, you know, maybe where we're at in the moment, anything else that they would like to ask, but uh, very insightful and we appreciate that, Sydney. So uh, you want to kick it off, Sherry? Do you have anything in your mind that you would like to ask at this point? Um, well, actually, just a comment. I really had never, um, ironically, I'll use the word thought about this, but I had never really thought about mindfulness, even kind of starting out of, of noticing some of the more pleasant senses and, and, and things coming in. Um, really, my understanding of mindfulness was more, you know, certainly living in the present, but also um, oftentimes accepting what is or what is going on in, in actually maybe more of a negative sense or the bad things that are happening to you at the moment. And I really liked how, how you mentioned um, taking in your example of the, the 
leaves on the trees and the blue sky and things like that because those do tend to be pleasant and I, th I would think would be a good way for beginners to really um, take those first steps towards being more mindful where it may not be such a, a, a deeper understanding but uh, more palatable and, and easier to give it a try anyhow. Yes, Sherry, that is so true. That is a, a, a great entree point for uh, many beginners in terms of practicing mindfulness. Um, and I want to say that connected to that are, are two conceptual pieces that can deepen mindfulness when they are experiencing something pleasurable. And one is to possibly connect into that savoring piece that I mentioned, because that's what can connect us more to our nervous systems and therefore settle us down, calm us more so too. Um, because this is, we are talking about the interconnection of mind and body and emotions and body and mind, all of it, we are all a system anyway. But um, the research shows that it is very, very helpful when we are experiencing pleasurable moments to not just think about it. It's like bring it whole system, whole body. If we can deepen that pleasure of walking through the woods or running through the woods and noticing the sky, the, the leaves. And yes, so you notice it, you're using your senses, but to really kind of feel it, getting the feeling part. So going beyond just head up, that make it whole body. So our entire body, like I can feel, when I look up at that blue sky, oh my gosh, that is absolutely gorgeous. So I'm saying that to myself, but where do I feel that sense of pleasure in my body? Um, and another part of um, deep mindfulness, and really it's a wonderful experience, like I said, for just calming us down, is gratitude. If we can also bring in our sense of gratitude for, you know, sometimes those little things that we kind of blow off, we forget about it, we get so caught up sometimes in what, what is wrong um, or what we did wrong because our brains are wired for negativity bias, for protection, so that's understood. But we have to work three times harder for our brains <laughs> and for our psyche and everything else to hold on to that good. Um, and there's a psychologist, his name is Rick Hansen. He's done a lot of studies on, he calls it bringing in the good and that the savoring part and the gratitude part helps us go beyond just head up or just cognitive and bringing in a whole body. And can we be thankful for, hey, you're walking through the woods, you're walking. I think to myself, hey, I'm not in the hospital. I'm able to walk. I work with veterans who have spinal cord injuries, and I think, my God, what might, they, what might that be like? I forget, these legs are moving my body, and just bringing in gratitude for having an able body, at least in this moment. So things like that, that we sometimes just forget, and it is so helpful for our well-being to situate ourselves and be with ourselves in terms of that pleasure because we have to amp that up three times more to kind of <laughs> offset some of the negativity. Yeah, thank you. Sure. So I have a, I have a question. Earlier you talked about, you know, self-like criticism. And right now we're gonna share information with district employees and district teachers and all that. They have been going above and beyond giving education to our children, but sometimes our self can be very negative. And so how could you share or could you share with the district employees on how they could find self-compassion for themselves? Because normally I am very great at finding compassion for others, but when it comes to myself, I'm not a good mom. I'm not a good trainer. I'm not, you know, I'm all these, I create the story of I am not. And so how could we find self-compassion in this time? That is really important. And actually, uh, when it comes to mindfulness-based practices of any sort, 
that um, the other major part of mindfulness is compassion and self-compassion. And I actually teach a, a class, it's an eight week class and it's called Mindful Self-Compassion out of University of California. Um, so if you take mindful self-compassion, the very first word is mindful. So you have to have the foundation of being mindful first in order to get to that self-compassion piece. So just what we've been talking about, being aware of what we're experiencing in the present moment um, and noticing it without getting caught up into um, high negativity or high reactivity, um, but just noticing it and can we be with it? Because it's really just a representation or reflection of our own pain and suffering when it's something difficult. And can we also be with difficulty or let's say our own inner critic, those people who have it, some people don't, most people do. Um, can we be with it uh, without going to the other end of the continuum? One end is to get caught up in it and to, you know, make it all up into like a tornado. We start screaming, hollering, yelling, whatever, however we show our reactivity. And then the other end is to ignore it to act like, oh, I'm not really angry. You know, it's like talking to somebody and, and you'll, you know that they're upset because of what just happened. And you'll ask the person, so are you okay? Are you all right? Are you upset? And the person says, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> Which the body always tells the truth anyway, even with the body language and the voice of what I just demonstrated. So it's not to ignore it. So We've got to have, especially with, since you talked about difficulty and difficult emotions and inner critic, et cetera, that is the part of the skill, the big skill in mindfulness of not ignoring, not minimizing, coming to our truth of how we're feeling, and even being able to actually identify, and you can do that internally, of how you're experiencing this present moment. So something happened, and you were really very upset. So instead of just saying, oh, I wasn't upset, it's like, no, I was really angry. I have, to experience, I have to say to myself, I was really angry, or I really felt shamed with that, or I really felt deep grief with that. Those are those difficult feelings. Or again, not being caught up into it. So where you just exacerbate it. So coming more to balance with that. And then once you can do that, the mindfulness piece, which that takes a lot of practice with difficult feelings. Then the next step is how do you respond when one is suffering? And when I say you, I don't mean you directly, I'm talking about anybody. How do we respond when we are suffering and we're noticing our suffering? Because here we've identified it, okay, I'm angry. It's like taking this piece of paper here and if I am identifying my anger, I kind of pull it outside myself because I'm observing it. It's like, oh, it's not just pushed down. It's not blown up. It's, it's, it's not just the totality of my experience here and the totality of me. I've made some space between myself and my experience and my feeling of anger enough where I can, I can observe it now. Like, okay. But how do I relate to my suffering around the anger? What do I do? What can I do? And so self-compassion would say, because the word compassion really means with suffering. It's, it's a Latin derivative, com, C-O-M, the first part of the word uh, is with. And then from the Latin derivative of passion is suffering. So, and then you put the word self in front, so self-compassion. So how can I be with my own suffering? And I would say to ask yourself this question, how would you respond to a friend who was experiencing a similar situation that you just experienced in terms of their pain and their suffering? How would you respond? What might be helpful? What do you need? That, that is the quintessential question to ask oneself. Okay, I'm really just <laughs> upset right now. What do you need? Do you need space? Do you need time? Do you need something else that could be soothing for you? 
do you need do you need to go in the bathroom and just close the door and just sit there and and cry or what i mean what do you need do you need to talk to somebody but if you don't have the space between your experience and yourself it's so identified it's so connected that you can't you can't see it you can't reflect upon it you have to pull it out and identify it clearly and then you're able to mindfully reflect more on that question those questions i asked what would what would you say like to a really good friend what would you say to that friend if that friend had a similar situation what might be helpful and not only that if you're talking to yourself what tone of voice because we're talking about connecting to the nervous system how, what would be your tone of voice to your friend um would you hug them would you i mean what would you do and and that may give you more data more mindful data about how to navigate and relate to your anger and any other difficult emotion let me let me maybe tie this together real quick and just ask you sydney um if there were maybe one or two real quick techniques bits of advice in this kind of perilous time that we're dealing with what would you say to 80% of the population about what needs to be done to be in a more mindful spirit and maybe help themselves through some of these tough times, knowing that, like Casey was mentioning earlier, uh, you know, with us being trapped at home, we're all, this is something totally new. Uh, we are social creatures. With that said, just one or two quick tips maybe that you could leave us with that might send us off with a bit of a, um, an elated spirit. How's that? Sure. I would say um, it can be very helpful to do something that is not so isolating. And one of the things that could be perfect is to move your body outside. If you could get into some kind of movement for those people who are open to that, and even for those people who aren't, and you might blow it off because sometimes there's some people with the isolation, it can cause some depressive symptomatology. And, and as you feel isolated, you can start to, the cocoon starts to close in and to even walk and sit on your front porch or something, or just walk across the porch or in your front yard or whatever, or wherever you live can be difficult because your mind is like, no, you're, you're just contracting. So find a way to uh, expand. And when I say expand, starting from the base, which is your body. So find a, a expansive somatic or bodily movement experience. It doesn't have to be big. It can be little. And if you can do it out in the sunlight, which research also shows that movement is helpful for being depressive and closed in and all of that, as well as light. The light hitting our retina can be more expansive for us too, in terms of mood, it can, it can really shift people's mood. And if you can do that, try to build in a little bit more of a routine, even if you feel like, okay, I did that one time, but maybe like every other day, or even if you did it for five minutes, um, I sometimes will suggest to clients, hey, if you don't like to walk, you don't like to run, you don't do yoga, you don't do Zumba, all of that, you could just go sit outside wherever you are. You could sit outside in the light and just notice nature around you. Just notice the world around you. So that would be one thing. And also that can give people a greater sense of control. And, and the more we feel like we're having to sit with uncertainty, the more we really need something, even if it's something small to control in our own internal experience and our external experience. So expanding, opening up, and then the other thing I would say is um, you can bring mindfulness to anything. Mindfulness is really free. <laughs> it's accessible. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere <laughs> to participate in mindfulness. So something that is self-soothing. I often suggest to my clients and other people to uh, create what I call a care card. Uh, some people call it care cards. Some people call it... Uh, self-soothing card. Some people call it my uh, de-stressing card. 
And some people will take even have a physical, you know, index card, and some people will put it on their smartphone. But at least three things that you can list that are soothing and that help you de-stress and come down. You've done it before. You stop and think about your life. There's some things you have done for most people that have finally helped them kind of regulate themselves and then come out of that fight and flight uh, nervous system and come back to some degree of rest and digest. So if you look back at your history when things were tough, uh, even before the COVID situation, what things did you, did, did you do? And these things are, I'm talking about little things. I'm not talking about big things. It could be, hey, I just need to take a shower because I need the warmth of the water on my body. And guess what? That's a wonderful mindfulness experience if you wanted to do it. Because you could feel the water and see when your head starts to move out about something else or a negative thought, just notice that your mind has wandered. And the practice is to bring your awareness back to the water. Like, oh, I can feel this. Rather than ruminating in the shower, like I'm going to just really enjoy the shower. I get in the bathtub. I mean, something simple. I need some time to not be listening to the news all day. And instead of doing that, I'm going to find a book that I really love. I've been wanting to read that book for a long time. And so I'm going to do that before bed and get away from the blue screens, which can impact sleep and those kinds of things. So I would say, yeah, find some, at least three small self-soothing activities that you've done before. It could be a, a, for some people, it's just, I need a soothing touch. I need to go to somebody and ask them for a hug, or actually you could give the hug to yourself in different ways. If you're okay with self-touch, some people aren't. Some people, it's just bringing their palms together. It's a very sensory motor. Like I'm just feeling this sensation. Some people, me, I tend to just rub my arm. <laughs> some people will put their hands here on the chest, some people will just do the, the fist bump, like, come on, motivate, come on, come on. You can get through this. And then connecting some positive intention with the movement. And that can also help rewire your brain and help soothe you as well. So those are just some possible examples. I love all of that. That is fantastic. And one of the things that you hit on that really drew my attention was the fact you mentioned free and both of these gals know I've talked about gather what is free. There is so many great things that are free. The air, the water, sleep, meditation, mindfulness. We could go on and on for days talking about what is actually free. Movement. Movement is free. The only cost that comes is calories and that's a good thing. So uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't know yet, do we have any other things that you gals would like to ask before we wrap it up and bring mention to our, our event that's coming up June 1 through 7? Um, anything else before we go? I don't think so. Thank you so much. This has been so helpful and great information. I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, Mike. It was a pleasure being with you and to share the possibilities around mindfulness with your viewers too. Um, I hope that it has been useful too. Yeah. yeah, it absolutely has. Thanks so much, Sydney. Um, and then lastly, just to bring to attention to everybody uh, that our um, run walk, uh, our virtual run walk, which is scheduled uh, June 1st through June 7th. For more information, I highly suggest that you look us up on the Consiglio Wellness Center uh, group, um, and uh, th that's a private group, but we also have a web page, the Consiglio Wellness Center uh, CWC page, which is available to you. So if you'd like to join in and find out more information about the Run Walk, please do so. I think we already have over 20 people signed up, so it's really starting to take off, and our goal is to try to get up near 100. So i um, really excited about getting that thing going, but that also is on Eventbrite, so you could look us up there. All the information is there, sort of the rules and how we're conducting everything. Uh, we have conversion charts so that you can either do a 5K, 10K, half marathon, full marathon if your heart is so inclined uh, during this time. And uh, so if you need some training advice or some other things, some tips, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'd certainly be able to help you with that as well. So 
thanks for joining us and uh, we'll talk to you next time.